Hello listeners and welcome to Popscreen, part of Geek Show Podcast Network. We are that corner of the Geek Show that likes to celebrate the good, the bad and the ridiculous of movies either starring about or by pop stars. No, the podcast covers a broad range of musical and cinematic genres from documentaries to science fiction, from country and western to hip-hop. I'm your host Graham Williamson, I'm a short filmmaker and I write for the Geek Show and Horrified.com, the British horror website. I've been joined this week by... Hello, uh, I am Prob, also known as Rob, also known as the host of Gossy News. I do most of the gaming stuff on the Geek Show now. So, yes, I do have opinions as an older gamer. No, I don't think that gamer should be a word that we use to identify people who play games, since most people who play games, and there is no word for anyone who watches movies or TV. So, there you go, mm. there's my credentials. <laughs> Fair point, yeah, yeah. It's true though, isn't it? Wasn't expected to be drawn so deep into a debate about something I don't care about so early in the podcast, if I'm honest. But <laughs> That's what I'm here for. <laughs> As you'll notice, my my habit is to derail the conversation. I am like that meteor in the sky that is heading towards planet Earth. Yes. Uh, and <laughs> after this podcast, Rob will also burn up in the upper atmosphere. But before that, we've got to... It's a new diet plan that I've got. <laughs> <laughs> we've got the finale of our month of boy-themed films. And listeners, it's not the side effects of the cocaine. I'm thinking that it must be David Bowie in a Jim Henson Creature Workshops production. This week's film is Labyrinth from 1986, not to be confused with Pan's Labyrinth, although it does have fairies and a sinister pale guy, but the only giant frog is the one he is apparently stuffed down the front of his pants. Yeah, technically this is a David Bowie double bill, isn't it? (laughs) (laughs) There's David Bowie, and there's David Bowie again. Yes, yeah. yeah. (laughs) Yes, um, we are probably going to mention David Bowie's cock more in this podcast than we did in the one for the man who fell to earth. So, <laughs> listeners, and he was I naked in that as well. In yeah, he was naked in that as well. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. But this is a, a youth certificate film from the creator of the Muppets, and yet it is like this. Yes. <laughs> I mean, do you when did you first see this film, Rob? When I was a kid. Mm, me too. I mean, I this was one of those you don't really get films like this now um, mm. that are aimed at children. So this is in that category of films that also included things like Watership Down, um, The Dark Crystal, which you know themes from The Dark Crystal include yeah. genocide. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um The Neverending Story mm. and Willow of all things, which mm. I have seen the trailer for the new Disney thing. It's a sequel and I am so up for it. But Right. Anyway, this was in the category of those films where you had this really, really dark fantasy or this really kind of surrealist take on the norms that everyone had, and it was there to challenge kids. You don't really get that now, where everything is kind of sanitised and safe. The closest you'll get to it in terms of animation, for example, are things like Infinity Train and Amphibia and things like that, from the Western perspective. Yeah. But those are more for teenage audiences rather than a universal audience. Yeah, that's the thing. I think the rise of the tween and teen audience kind of siphoned that element you're talking about out of kids' movies. It could be sort of put away safely in something for slightly older kids. 
Yeah, and that I think has been that is something that I think has been a real detriment for development of children in general, mm. especially across the Western world, because for generations we grew up with fairy tales and nursery rhymes and stories that literally at their root involved blood and death. Yeah. We grew up with those for generations, for thousands of years, and then all of a sudden in the last 20 to 30 years, they're not the thing that you should be teaching your kids. And I'm like, well, why? When we survived as a species for tens of thousands of years with these as teaching methods, all of a sudden we're being told not to teach our kids these things. Yeah. Which makes no sense I suppose to me. I, I don't want to be too prescriptive about this because I, as someone who is pushing 40, do not watch much sort of kid stuff. So I can't really say whether it's it's doing stuff that hits the audience like this. I would say that there are some like difficult life lessons done in yeah. a scary way in the Harry Potter franchise, like the, the death of a mentor, oh, yeah. you know, the uh, weight of expectations uh, put on a kid, um, coping with your favourite author, becoming a bigoted asshole. all of the difficult stuff is in there. <laughs> um, but yeah, there, there See, isn't... The coping with your favourite author, becoming a bigoted asshole. I got over <laughs> that years ago. When I discovered the truth about Orson Scott Card. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. I mean, it's an increasingly essential survival skill for the modern world. They'll all let you down sooner or later. I was a fucking Morrissey fan. I know what I'm talking about. (laughs) Yeah, you kind of had it worse than me. (laughs) At least I, I, I read Ender's Game and I thought, oh, this is brilliant. And then I read the sequels to Ender's Game. And I thought, oh, yeah, really good storytelling. Really wanted to read more stuff. And then I found out, yeah, <laughs> Austin Scott Guard, not really the nicest of people. Really mm. want to read more of his stuff. I wonder I mean, what he's... his blog's like. That would have been uh, the, the yes. cruelest way to be let down, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, it's, just, it's just one of those things. That, you know, um... It's a case of living long enough to become the villain, I suppose. Yes, that's very true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I hate to put it in those terms, but... Well, I mean, in a, in a much more wholesome way, Boy was well into his career here. Boy would have been a good sort of 25 years mm. since he signed his first record deal, and he yeah. is playing the villain here in a, in a, in a more yeah. enjoyable way than some real-life villains would oh, yeah. Mention. Yeah. I think I think it's one of those things where, um, let's see, there are certain people who, when they play the villain, they do it remarkably well. Mm. And one of the reasons for that is because you never envision them playing the villain. Mm. Um, yeah. I always bring to mind one specific example um, because it's kind of the perfect example. It's Harry Connick Jr. in um, um, yeah, oh, what was that? that film, Copycat. Yeah. Where he plays the serial killer in Copycat. And you're like, it's Harry Connick Jr. <laughs> he's like the nicest guy in music. He's yes. on, he's only had like one or two film roles. The other film role, he was a lovely person in that one. His other role is a serial killer. And a very convincing one at that. Yeah, yeah. I think there's th- there are some good sort of cases of what I guess you would call twist casting out there like that. Yeah. I mean, Marvel... And I think Bowie in Labyrinth is a, is yeah. a good example of that. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's a well-pitched performance because playing a villain in a children's movie specifically, you have to calibrate it very carefully. You can't be absolutely evil. You have to be evil enough to be fun. Yeah. I mean, it's... Uh, what was the... What was the uh... The Mike Myers line, it's not evil, it's evil. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You know, the fru- the fruits of the devil kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. That he... that, that that very slightly camp evil that you remember Grotbags from uh from uh Rod Hall and Emu? I do, yes, yeah. Yeah, it's it's Grotbags. That's yeah. basically what you have to be. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, 
even the hair and makeup isn't a million miles off. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so he has, I mean, you, you don't expect sensible hair when David Bowie turns no. up, but this might be the most staggering haircut he has ever had. The hole in the ozone layer oh. was caused by the hair and makeup team on this. I have a firm belief that David Bowie started K-pop hair. <laughs> K-pop hair is all from David Bowie in Labyrinth. It's where it originated. It, he, he is the K-pop hair progenitor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Prove, prove me wrong on this. I challenge anyone to prove me wrong on this. He had K-pop hair before K-pop was even a thing. It might be the case, might Nick, as South Korea would have just been liberalising at that point. So there could be a generation of kids who saw their first Western film, and it was Labyrinth, and it had this, this impact on them. They thought, I too will be a Western-style singer with enormous hair. It explains a lot of things. It explains the tight trousers, the baggy shirts, and the hair. Yes. And that is K-pop. <laughs> and I'm sorry, but why do they dance all the time? It's in the song Dance Magic Dance. <laughs> yes, because this is uh unless you count bar, I guess this is the only film that we're doing for Boy Month, which is a full on musical. It's certainly the only film we're doing with songs there's a musical with songs written by Boy. Yeah. And it comes and at I mean not the Best point of his career, it would be fair to say. He's just released tonight. Yeah. He's about to release Never Let Me Down. So, in the context, this is actually his best album for quite a while, the soundtrack to Labyrinth. And it's got some catchy tunes. Yeah. Fire Dance is catchy. Yeah. And, you know, I, I mean, the thing is, you might be right about the generational thing because. What do people say when they see a really cool dance now? That dance is fire. Yes. Maybe every so, modern trend is traceable directly back to Labyrinth. <laughs> you never know. I, 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 I'm, I, I'm sure that, uh, what was it, the, the, the uh, Bog of Eternal Stench had something to do with certain parts of the internet. Yes. And what is social media if not a high tech version of that moss that's full of eyes and watches you all the time? Yes. Yeah, it's all coming together. Oh, the uh, the allegories are strong in this one. Yes. Well, also consciously, yes, isn't it? Because it's it's surprisingly consistently themed as a coming of age movie. I mean, We've talked about yeah. it as a children's movie, but that's not the age of the protagonist. The protagonist, Sarah, is about 14, 15. So it's got yeah. more of an adolescent theme to it, even if it is a children's movie. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, what I love is, uh, what I love about it, uh, from, from the beginning, it's one of those films where it plays on what you think the fantasy thing is supposed to be. Mm. So... When she's having to look after her brother. I mean, uh, maybe you should set the scene first before we get into this. Yeah, S Sarah is a, a dramatic, angsty teenager played by a young Jennifer Connolly, um, who is forced to look after her little brother. What was the brother named? Toby. Her little brother, Toby. Yeah. Uh, who cries all the time and who she sees as an absolute pest. And she starts to wish to herself that someone would take Toby away. But she's overheard saying this through the realms, through into another world, by an army of goblins. And when she says it in the exact right way, the goblin king, David Bowie, uh, comes into her bedroom, steady, throws a snake at her, steady again, uh, and takes the baby. <laughs> and she has to go and get Toby back. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, dodgy motifs and dodgy lyrics from songs aside. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, there are parts, parts of this that are questionable, <laughs> let's see. Yeah, I mean, 
Uh, I can't remember how I reacted to the helping hands when I was young. I probably mm. just thought it was very clever. But now you do think, it's, yeah, oh shit, it's... you've just thrown a 14-year-old girl into a load of hands. Yeah, it's kind of, mmm. Yeah. You couldn't get away with that now, could you? Not really, no, no. But, uh, yeah, I mean, there's that, and there's various other bits. But the thing that I, the th- the very first thing that I stood out for me before mm. even David Bowie turns up was the whole bit where she's holding Toby and she's doing the whole Goblin King, Goblin King, blah, 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 take yeah. this child away from me. And, and, you think, oh, there's a crack of thunder. You think, oh, right, the, the child's going to disappear. The Goblin King's going to turn up. And then nothing happens. Because mm. your expectations have been subverted because those aren't the right words. Yes. And there's a lot of that kind of thing in the script, isn't there? It's, it's written, yeah. it was written by a number of people, but the main voice in the script is Terry Jones, uh, ex of Monty Python and Ripping Yarns. And there's yeah. a lot of very funny stuff here that undercuts the the familiar fairy tale yeah. motifs that it's playing with. I mean, uh, in a sense, Labyrinth kind of gave rise to what would eventually become Shrek. Yeah, because actually, yeah, a lot of the a lot of the humor is mirrored in what became Shrek later on. So it wouldn't be past beyond the bounds of possibility for a young Mike Myers, for example, mm. to have watched Labyrinth being influenced by the humour of it, and then when it comes to Shrek... Yeah, I, I've I've always thought there was a shared sensibility between Mike mm. Myers and K-pop bands, and it's that's it, <laughs> isn't it? It all comes from that, yeah. I don't know. I mean, uh, there's that new show. He's got the Pentangle. Yes. <laughs> oh, the Pentaveret, sorry. The Pentaveret, which I know for a fact is... Inspired from his movie, So I Married an Axe Murderer. It is. Because yes, that's where it's first mentioned. The Pentangle would be uh, Mike Myers' biopic of a 70s folk band. It's a niche yeah. joke, but I made it. Happy now? <laughs> yes. But I do remember from So I Married an Axe Murderer, the uh, the five... The, the, it was uh, the Queen, the Pope, the Gettys, the Rothschilds, and Colonel Sanders before he went tits up. <laughs> that was literally how it was said and all of the accents of those people if you blend them together you get Tom Hanks playing Colonel Tom Parker in that new Elvis movie <laughs> sorry I just want Tom Hanks plays the Queen now <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah, the last scene of the crown went in a weird direction, didn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, there's a part of my brain that is doing cartwheels at the thought of that happening. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, back Labyrinth, to... Labyrinth, though. Um, yes. yes. <laughs> it's a beautifully designed film, isn't it? I mean, you expect great yeah. things from Jim Henson by this stage, but every set, every effect is really gorgeous to look at. I mean, am I wrong in thinking that this was one of the ones where he, where Henson and his cohorts had a lot of control over the set design, whereas in previous efforts they'd only had like marginal control over how everything was supposed to look, but this time it was one of the first times where they actually had almost full control over everything. Yeah, it was except a pretty the direct ship. It was a well funded film. You know, it, it cost twelve million back when twelve million meant something. And um mm. it had some I mean there's some remarkable talent involved here. Kevin Clash who went on to be the puppeteer of Elmo in Sesame Street is behind yeah. a lot of the puppets. Um I don't know. Do, are you aware of who voices and co puppeteers Ludo? Ludo? I, don't, I, I, I did know this because it, it, it was remarkably similar to uh, how, how Groot works because everyone, when they found out Vin Diesel was Groot, 
It was like, no, that's never, that's never Groot. And like, yes, it is. And it's exactly the same kind of scenario as that. I think it, but I can't it, remember it is, who it is. It's a bit more niche than finding out that it's Vin Diesel, but uh, Ludo was an early job for the acclaimed contemporary sculptor Ron Muek, uh, who... Who, who makes these astonishing, like, hyper-realist sculptures there of, of people's faces, but they're extremely yeah. outsized oh, or yes, undersized. Yes, yes yeah, I remember you'll him. have seen some yeah. of them. And it is, whenever you walk around an art gallery and see some Ron Muick, you can take the the sort of unease of seeing these quite disturbing sculptures away by just imagining him in a vocal booth going, SMELL BAD! <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. When you look at the talent list of this, mm. was it, um, uh, who did David Shaughnessy play? It was um, the Sididimus or something? Can't remember the name. Oh, I don't know. Let me have a look. I don't know that guy. What did he say his name was again? David Shaughnessy. David Shaughnessy. Oh yes, yes, he is Sir Didymus. You're right. Yeah. He, David Shaughnessy's done stuff with uh, Mass Effect and video games like The Darkness ah. and Elder Scrolls and Warcraft stuff like that. So that's why I know him a lot more. A couple of big names from the geekier side of things in the cast. Uh, a couple of the little fire spirits. Uh, voiced by Danny John Jewels. Yep. Who was, of course, the cat on Red Dwarf. And I have to look this one up because this is not my territory, uh, this show. But um, the choreographer was Cheryl McFadden, who later played Dr. Beverly Crusher on Star mm-hmm. Trek. Iron, isn't her name Gates McFadden? It, it has her listed in this book as Cheryl quote Gates McFadden so yeah I guess that's what they're hinting at wow I didn't know that yeah that's that's impressive I, 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 I am seriously impressed by that all the Star Trek fans listening because it meant I, I meant very little to me but I knew it meant something I mean well yeah I mean any fan of the next generation or anyone who's got any knowledge of the next generation will know they might not be as familiar with Beverly Crusher, but they'll definitely know her son. Oh, of course, Wesley Crusher, yes. Shut up, Wesley. <laughs> it's a meme, and Will Wheaton is also a meme because yes. he was in the Big Bang Theory, and now there is the meme of uh, of Sheldon just going, Wheaton! Right. In the kind of Wrath of Khan kind of thing. Yeah, so there's a, a remarkable amount of talent here. It did not do quite as well at the box office as you might think. It, it's one of those things that it's a touchstone for anyone who watched it growing up. It's just that not enough people watched it when they were growing up at the cinema. Yeah, but that's kind of because of the time it was. I mean, even Disney was, at the time, experimenting with dark fantasy for children mm. because that it was around that time that disney did the black cauldron yeah yeah and i think the hunchback of Notre Dame was early 90s so it wasn't too much too much longer afterwards but the black cauldron was something that was so very outside of disney's remit yeah was it like was it late seventies or early eighties when they were doing stuff like something wicked this way comes? Some very um, odd stuff in that era of Disney. Yeah, there was. I mean, uh, the Black Cauldron was kind of the culmination of it, or rather, the Hunchback of Notre Dame was. But that, but that had songs in, so that was the end of it for Disney musical animated animation. Mm. Whereas Disney animation in general, without the music, Black Cauldron was clearly the end of them going. We're not going to mess with all this dark stuff anymore. We're not going to have any walking corpses or horned (laughs) kings or people coming back from the dead or anything like that. We're just going to leave it to one side. Yeah. Nobody's going to have to throw themselves into a cauldron and die just to basically free everybody else. Unjustifiable, but yes. 
<laughs> I mean, that's so, what yeah, you want that... from from a kids' movie, isn't it? Thing is, I know the Black Cauldron gets a lot of bad press, but that's only because Disney, in their wisdom, did what Hollywood studios do with every single decent story. They take the first two books, smash them together until it's unintelligible, and then release it. Yes. Well, they don't now, whilst Denny Villeneuve will tell you you can get a green light for, you know, just doing half of one book. They've gone the complete opposite way. Yeah, I know. Now you can get three three movies out of one book. Yeah. Just look at The Hobbit. <laughs> you can and you shouldn't, but you do. <laughs> Yeah, you really shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> you really shouldn't. Anyway, back to Labyrinth. Yes. Back to my childhood. <laughs> Our childhood. <laughs> Indeed, yeah. I saw this. I, I saw a bit of this when I was growing up, and I found it very frightening. I, I that that moss. It's only there for a second, but I found that moss really disturbing and. I found Bowie's Goblin King a bit unnerving, really. I didn't listen to Bowie when I was a kid, largely because I thought, you know, you you can't reward this guy's behaviour of kidnapping babies. I know that's probably cancel culture now. I know you're probably meant to be quite indulgent towards baby kidnapping in the arts, but um, I didn't like it. I didn't rate it. (laughs) I'm sorry, but... (laughs) <laughs> the idea of artistic baby kidnapping just my mind rebels against it as it should <laughs> can you imagine applying to the uh, can you imagine applying to the arts council of england saying <laughs> i have a great project <laughs> i mean it's only a hair away from that old enough show on netflix isn't it yes oh i avoid things like that I just take one look at them and go, nope. I mean, you say things like that, uh, judging by their share price, you might just mean things that are on Netflix. I stopped watching Netflix about six months ago. Mm. I think it was around the time when they decided they were going to air that documentary. You know the one I'm talking about. I went, Uh, nope, I can't in good conscience watch Netflix anymore. Yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a few of them like that, isn't it? It's very strange because whenever anyone announces a true crime film or a television show, everyone's like, oh, disgusting. They're just trying mm. to make money off it. And and then statistically, some of those same people must be the people who were happily sitting down to watch another 900-part Netflix documentary about the exact same crime. And you think, well, is it yeah. that different? Is one really so much worse than the other? I mean, anything can be uh, covered with the uh, the label of a documentary, but at the mm. end of the day, there's there's documentaries, and then there's there's things that are just very, very clearly uncomfortable viewing for any normal person. Which is how I used to feel about labyrinth. Yeah. <laughs> and how people feel about Labyrinth now. <laughs> <laughs> Especially with things like the Pit of Hands. Uh, yeah, the, the Gropy Chasm, yes. Yeah, Gropy Chasm. Um, and uh, David Bowie following David Bowie. <laughs> hey, though, how, as, speaking of impossible geometry... How great is the Escher <laughs> staircase sequence? <laughs> I, I, I have never heard it referred to as impossible geometry, <laughs> but I am keeping that. That is just the perfect description of it. <laughs> the non Euclidean crotch. <laughs> and there's your episode title. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, I, I if if I saw an episode called the non Euclidean crotch, I would click on it just out of sheer curiosity. I mean, 
that's that's how people get into trouble on the internet, though, isn't it? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I oh right, but I would, I would, I'd see the title, I'd be like, "The hell is this about?" Yes, <laughs> click. Or oh, we could we could hashtag but, it so that anyone searching for non Euclidean crotches on audio <laughs> boom would <laughs> would easily find us among the search results. Well, just on the internet in general, just yeah. <laughs> put it out on Twitter or something. Hashtag <laughs> non Euclidean crotch. <laughs> oh, if there is a hashtag already on Twitter that says non Euclidean crotch, I might die. Yeah, that that's the point at which you, you're going to have to admit that the internet's finished. We've done enough with <laughs> exactly. it. Exactly. But yeah, I mean, the Escher staircase and that whole scene, I absolutely loved that yeah. bit. It was so well done. And it was one of the few occasions where you see it in live action and for the time, it is reasonably seamless. Yeah. I think it looks great now, to be honest. I mean... I mean, it does stand up, but e- even for its time, and especially for its time, it was reasonably seamless. I think the only bit of effects work that's dated is the fiery sequence, where it's mm. very obvious that in order to get the puppeters like, moving these things correctly, they've had to put them in front of quite bad green screen. Yeah. Well, you say bad green screen. You and I have covered Free Jack. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And this was out before Free Jack. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't and think yet... bad screen, green screen is a hanging offence. I like John Pertwee the Doctor Who, which has the worst yeah. blue screen effects in history. <laughs> and yet somehow still better than Free Jack. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> You can't judge a film or a TV show by the quality of its green screen. No, no, you can't. <laughs> I'm just pointing out that both Labyrinth and John Pertwee era Doctor Who were both before Free Jack. Yes. Technology and cinema capabilities, camera capabilities, everything had moved on by the time Free Jack came around, and yet it still somehow managed to be utter shit. I love how we're talking about Free Jack like it's the fucking crucifixion or something. And there's a before Free Jack and an after Free Jack. Mankind will never retain the state of innocence it had before Free Jack. Well, yeah, kind of. Because when everyone witnessed the the horrible green screen in Free Jack, everyone went, no, never again shall we subject cinema goers to this travesty. (laughs) Let's burn down the effect studio so this can yeah. never happen again. Yes. One effect thing I'd forgotten about this film, because it wouldn't have registered with me when I saw it as a kid, is that this has some early CGI in it. Yes, yes it does. And it thing is, it's very subtle in its usage. Mm. It's not blatant. I remember, I think... There were films like Lensman and Star Trek, the the Wrath of Khan, I think it was, okay. where you had very early integration of computer graphics with the film. Yeah. But it wasn't effects work. It was basically something was on a computer screen and you saw it and that was it. Right. Except for, I think, at the end of the Wrath of Khan where you have the terraforming thing. And then that was like very early effects work, very early CG used in a movie. But it was a lot better in Labyrinth because it was a lot more small scale. You weren't terraforming a planet. Yes. And I think that's, in some ways, that's generally when I really liked CGI, when it was too early to be absolutely reliant on it. Like, yeah. the first Jurassic Park still looks great because they don't push it too hard. You know, they use CGI, but they also use other effects techniques, and your eye never has the chance to get used to any of it. Yeah, I mean, uh, when they strike that happy medium of practical effects and CGI, which Labyrinth really did, I mean, it was heavy with the practical effects. It was very, very heavy with the practical effects, because it was a lot of puppetry involved in it. Mm -hmm. 
But I really liked the fact that because it was so heavy with practical effects, uh, it was effectively cheaper to just keep everything as practical effects. Minimal yeah. CGI usage, but it really fit. Everything really worked. And I think that's one of the reasons why the Escher staircase scene works so well. Mm. Is because your eye is so focused on the practical side of things and so keyed into the practical side of things that you don't notice the slight um the slight continuity issues with the Escher staircase scene. You overlook them completely because it's just there are so many you know, practical effects are so organic in their way. Yeah. So your eyes are a lot more forgiving when it comes to uh, little flaws in how things move or how things fit together. And I think that's another part of why the film has the tone you were talking about earlier, why it does feel slightly darker, because there's something slightly uncanny about how these things are real but not real. Yeah. You don't believe in them necessarily as living things, but they're clearly physical and they're moving. And there's a sort of, before you know how it's done, when you're a kid, there's a sort of paradox in that. You can't work it out. Kind of like K-pop stars. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> I haven't done a K-pop episode because I know I, whatever I say, I will be absolutely murdered. Uh, so if any K-pop stands are listening to this, it's Rob's fault. Rob keeps bringing it up, not me. I, hang on. I am allowed to. Do you know why? Because I was why? following K-pop before they even knew it was K-pop. Just, right. like, uh, just like everything else. I, I am one of those really old... I, I mean, I'm mid-40s now. I was watching anime before we even knew what the word anime was. I was reading manga before we knew what the word manga was. I was following <laughs> Japanese and Korean music before just about anyone else I knew. So, yeah, I think I'm in a fairly reasonable position to tease K-pop. Yeah, yes. Yeah, I don't mean to say I don't the, like the... K-pop, but I'm allowed to take the piss out of it. Let's hope that the genre's fans have the same sense of humour about it that you do. They don't. They don't. <laughs> do I care? No. <laughs> <laughs> I just tell them dad jokes until they go away. <laughs> <laughs> um, we should talk a bit about Connolly because this is yes. so early in Jennifer Connolly's career. It's incredible, and she is really good in this role. Oh, I mean, you could tell when you see her on screen. There are some scenes where she seems a bit waifish, but there are other scenes where you really get a sense of just how good an actress she was right at the beginning. Yeah, I think it's it's what I love about this performance is it's it's that it's really easy to tell the difference between Jennifer Connolly acting, which is very good, yeah, and uh, Sarah acting where she's quite hammy, and she yeah. manages to do that without making heavy weather of it, which is something that actresses and actors who are a lot older struggle with doing. I find. Yeah, I mean, I've always liked Jennifer Connolly as an as an actor and i've always especially since labyrinth mm. since the first time i saw her in labyrinth i've basically followed her career and i have enjoyed some of the roles that she's been in but i feel that throughout her career she's kind of been a lot of the time she's been cast in roles where maybe she couldn't really shine in the I way find that a lot of her adult work a bit like mm. overly serious you know what i mean i, I don't mind it being yeah, a bit serious but i wish she'd just do something that was at least slightly fun once in a while the, the thing is i think that she's in that role where she's getting miscast as a very serious type actor and i just keep watching her in these really serious roles and i'm just like but she was so much fun as a kid. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And you don't lose that. Yeah. It's just, you don't really lose that sensibility about yourself or your performances. Mm. I mean, um, I watched her I watched her in A Beautiful Mind, right? Yeah. And I thought she was really good in that. But then I watched her in Eternal Sun, uh, sorry, um, in, um, not Eternal Sunshine, it was um, Requiem for a Dream. And I just think, this is grim. <laughs> 
Yes, it is. It really is. Yeah. Yeah, but it just feels like somewhere between those two, Hollywood has decided she's this type of actress and only this type of actress. Hmm. Yeah, and before this, I mean, she was doing some really varied stuff in her early career. Before this, she did uh, Phenomena, a Dario Argento movie that is insane even by the standards of Dario Argento movies. And it's really yeah. great. I know she is slightly sniffy about Phenomena now. She shouldn't be. It's brilliant. Yeah, exactly. It's a shame, though, because Jennifer Connelly is kind of like Mia Sara in that respect, because both of them have been kind of miscast by Hollywood in roles that they don't really belong. Mia Sara was the last from Legend. Ah, right. Yes. Yeah, I, I was just looking that up. And now. she's also... Yeah, she's also the girlfriend from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Right. And And she she actually did some horror stuff. I'm just looking it up, and by an extraordinary coincidence, she is also married to Brian Henson, son of Jim Henson. Yep. That's... That's why her name popped into my head. Right, okay, yeah. Uh, that, That was a pure surprise to me. Well, her name popped into my head because I forgot what of those films from when I was a kid that were really dark fantasies but very much aimed at children. Legend was the one I forgot. Right, yes, yeah. With a very, very young Tom Cruise. Yes, indeed. Although every era's Tom Cruise is a disarmingly young Tom Cruise, isn't it? Yes, yes it is. <laughs> he is. And what is the proper pronoun for Tom Cruise these days? Uh, I I don't know. <laughs> I just know that I I look at him or whatever he is and just think maybe Scientology has the right ideas in some ways. Maybe this cleansing your yeah. body of I... negative thetans is, you know, maybe maybe we've misjudged it. Maybe we've dismissed it too early. Well, I mean, um, they do say a cleanse is as good as a rest, so yes. I don't know what sort of cleanse. <laughs> <laughs> there are other types of cleanse when yes. you're in Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, let's let's move it out from the uh, from the Gwyneth Paltrow zone here. I think, uh... but but we still have to talk about the Bog of Eternal Stench, so we can't. <laughs> Yes, that's a remarkable <laughs> sequence, isn't it? Basically, ten solid minutes of the same fart joke, and it doesn't get old somehow. And do you know what I think influenced that? Oh, I, I, I am super serious on this. I honestly think the Bog of Eternal Stench was influenced by that, by that camp scene in Blazing Saddles. Yes, yes, I think that's very plausible. <laughs> I mean, I think whoever planned the Bog of Eternal Stench looked at that scene and thought, I have an idea. <laughs> <laughs> especially when especially when the foreman comes out of the tent, he's like, Whoa! Yes. Well, the most disturbing thing about the Bog of Eternal Stench sequence is that afterwards you have that scene where Sarah is tempted by like a vision of just going back home and leaving Toby there. And she jumps on the bed oh. wearing her shoes. And you think, hang on, yeah. you, you've just been in the Bog of Eternal Stench. Shoes on a bed are a bad idea at the best of times, but this time... Yeah, because say what you like about the Bog of Eternal Stench. I mean, they try, they say, oh, don't fall in it. But what if you get some on you? Yes. Because it is sputtering. I mean, you are talking about spatter. You know, spatter does happen. Yeah, there's there's, there's splashback, isn't there? Yeah, (laughs) splashback is... Sorry, splashback. I choose my words. It's, got, it's, one, it's one of those words that's just, <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> the thing that I one of the things about Labyrinth that really is engaging for for me, especially when I was a kid, mm. were 
characters like Ludo and um, and the the dog knight. Oh yes, he's <laughs> on marvelous. Sheep dog. And Hoggle. Hoggle, we have. I absolutely Hoggle. loved Hoggle. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how do you make a character who is clearly a puppet so engaging and so believable? And he's so grotesque. And it's ugly, one thing for Ludo. He's he's ugly in yeah. a way that sort of makes you feel for him. It's very strange. I mean, Ludo, you can get away with because he's a big hairy monster, and obviously, you know, Ludo is the progenitor of um, what's his face from Monsters Inc. Yes, Sully. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Ludo is. You could literally say Ludo is uh, Sully's. Old granddad, who's slightly yeah. lost his way. Yes, he has. Yeah, <laughs> doesn't know where he is and needs a, needs a young girl's help to find his way home. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just googling just... Uh, so, some of the creatures in it, and there's a bizarre thing where that the, some website I won't mention their name because it's clickbait, but. They have done one of those things where they do see the cast of this movie before and after. And it's like normally it's a picture of someone who's when they were young and someone when they were slightly older. But if it's a picture of like a grotesquely ugly puppet and then just some old bloke, it's like, well, yeah, I wasn't <laughs> expecting them to look massively similar, if I'm honest. Uh, if, if anything, they've had a real glope since they were in Labyrinth. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's it's a bizarre thing, but Hoggle is a creature, though. Hoggle mm. is a as a character, not a creature. Sorry. There's a lot to like about him as a character. Yes, I think even more so than David Bowie and Sarah. Mm. I think Hoggle is. I think Hoggle's journey throughout this whole story is the one that really fit with me the most. Going from yeah. somebody who was forever being scared of where he was and who was going to come after him next. To actually, uh, you know, liking someone. I do wonder if there was a bit more of Hoggle's journey that was like in other drafts of the screenplay, because this was drafted and redrafted by a lot of mm. different people. And there is that odd dangling line where Jareth is taunting Hoggle and he says, uh, Maybe if she kisses you, I'll turn you into a prince. And that seems set up for that to come back in some way, to, like, bite Javith somehow, but it never does. See, there is a theory. There is a theory. Mm. It's time for theory crafting time. Okay, and okay, I'm ready. This, this hasn't been proven, but there is a theory that the Goblin King, Jareth, is not the first Goblin King. Right. And that the first Goblin King had two sons. Hmm. Jareth and Hoggle. Ah. And so when he says that line, maybe she, if she kisses you, I'll turn you into a prince. He's saying it because Hoggle already is the prince. He is and was supposed to be the Goblin King. But through a coup d'etat, Jareth took the throne, which is why Hoggle is basically living the way he is. An interesting idea, one that is either undercut Come... or not, I guess, by Bowie's comment about Jareth, which is that he said he, he always saw Jareth as being sort of pushed into the role of being the Goblin King and not actually giving much of a shit. I think his exact quote was, I pictured him as someone who'd rather be down in Soho, which may just be where Bowie's head was by that point in the 80s, but... Uh... Probably. I mean, uh, I think from a narrative... If you look at it from a narrative viewpoint, the idea of Jareth taking the throne through a coup d'etat, yeah, neither here nor there. But the idea of Jareth and Hoggle being brothers is mm. something that is plausible. The two yeah. of them have a much stronger relationship than Jareth does with the rest of the goblins, for example. Yeah, you know, yeah, that's very true. They, 
I mean, uh, there's a scene, where, if I remember rightly, where Hoggle actually addresses Jareth by name. Which, That's true, yeah. You know, that actually suggests that they know each other of old and that their their relationship is something outside of the norm. It's definitely more familiar a relationship than anyone else gets with Jareth, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah, that's and a good point. Regardless, regardless of what you think about, you know, or what David Bowie says Jareth is, there is something there that su- suggests... I can't even say suggests now. <laughs> without rolling the S. That suggests something deeper, something on a more personal level. Yes. Which is one of the reasons why I like Hoggle so much as a character and why I wanted more of Hoggle. I wanted to see more of that world as well. Well, there has been a a licensed continuation of this. There's a series Mm. of comic books that pick up, I don't know how long after the events of Labyrinth, but after. Yeah, and they did expand a little bit on various aspects of the story, but even then, it just felt very, very watered down. Because it doesn't have frequent David Bowie musical numbers. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. It tried. It tried. Okay. Some of the comics tried. Don't get me wrong. I've read a comic version of Labyrinth, right? Yeah. And they tried to do the fire dance bit with the puppets throwing, you know, okay. with the fire fire sprites throwing the heads around and everything like that. And the little musical notes and you're just like, it's just not the same. It isn't the same. No matter what you do. I wanted to cry. Because in my head, I could hear the song, and I just thought, no. If this is how you're introducing new generations to Labyrinth, just let them watch the film. Yes, absolutely, yeah. Yes. So, any uh, thoughts, any further thoughts on Labyrinth before we close out? Any further insane fan theories about the nature of Hoggle that we haven't covered? Um, no, I I mean... (laughs) The Dog Knight was the Dog Knight was kind of a random appearance. He just appeared. The Dog Knight rises, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh <laughs> so I just I literally just got what you said. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole bit with the fruit where she, the that scene that you're talking about where she kind of jumps on the bed. Yeah. That whole bit cuz that is part of this sequence where she kind of goes to the ballroom and stuff like that, and it's all yeah, you know, David Bowie with the with the fake hands or someone else's hands doing all the tricks with balls. Pardon the suggestion there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, these are fake I, arms. Just what I, at the time I thought, and this is quite literally the thought in my brain when I was a kid. He's in a ballroom playing with balls. Yeah. I was a lot more innocent then, so I didn't actually put two and two together and come up with five. Yeah, you didn't um you didn't connect it with his dress sense. No. Which... No. And I didn't connect any of the subtext about you know, domestic violence kind of thing that was already mm. in there. Which yeah. is you know, that whole love me and I will be your slave kind of thing, that whole I would be your yeah. slave, yeah, which is the title of a song on Bowie's 2002 album, Heathen. Mm. So, you know, it, it had, for all this film is is kind of an odd pit stop in the Bowie canon, it had some impact on his later work. Well, it did, because I think just like the character of Sarah, Bowie himself was kind of maturing as a performer. Yeah. As a a songwriter, as a musician, as an artist in general. And I think Labyrinth was an important transition for him. I think that a lot of the stuff that came later, some of the roots for those things can be tracked right back to Labyrinth and the things he learned doing that film. It is one of those things, isn't it, where you you grow up to such an extent that you were happy being childish. Yeah. Or, as Bowie himself put it when he was interviewed on set, 
20 years later and here I am working with goblins again. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, that's as good a stopping point as any. I think so. But, but, <laughs> but, yeah. And I know it's a good stopping point, but I'm going to throw this one thing in there. Okay. The music in this film is really good. Yeah. And it's the one thing that we haven't really properly looked at because I feel like it's, as you said, a separate album in its own right. Yeah. And each Bowie album you could literally devote an entire show to. I think it is much more graceful at incorporating, in something like As the World Turns, it is much more... Yeah skilled at incorporating those 80s sounds into his music than something like Tonight, where it, it really yeah. does sound like he's got a set of songs, he's played them, and then he's thought, oh shit, what do the kids like now? Well, synthesise it, let's put... Meow, 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 meow. Let's put that over yeah. it. This is much more... It, it feels... It, it feels insane saying this, but it is a development of the kind of synth work that he was doing on uh, on the ambient tracks on albums like Low and Heroes, just in a more yeah. kind of pop musical format. Yeah, whereas you look at... I mean, when everyone talks about Labyrinth, the main songs that they remember are Fire Dance and Dance Magic Dance. Mm, yeah. You know, those are the two that they remember, and it's because they're catchy, they're poppy... And you know you can got the move around to them. Who do? Who do? You do bit in it, which is great. Yeah. And they've got lines like "smack that baby, make him squeal." <laughs> yes. <Us. laughs> Again, kids' films aren't about punching babies anymore, are they? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, and fire dance. I don't know what country they're from. Somewhere in the Caribbean, I would assume, given their yes. accents. But you know the fact that they are pulling each other's heads off and they want to pull Sarah's head off and replace it with one their own. Mm. Very dark for very for such a jolly song. Yes, absolutely, yeah. But I mean, I think that is something that lends itself to how Bowie worked on several of his later songs, where that juxtaposition between the jolly lightness, the tone of the music belied the kind of darkness of the visuals. Yeah, yeah. And I think there's always that sort of tension in Bowie, and it's part of what makes him brilliant. You know, he he made yeah. it big with a, a album full of big, brash, catchy glam tunes that is nevertheless about the end of the world. And that's yep. obviously kind of a lens that you can look at the whole rest of his career. You know, he... He tends to go off piste when he becomes either too dark or too light, but he normally finds himself somewhere in the middle in a really effective way. Yeah, and I do remember the worst bit of CG in the film. Oh? Yeah, the very worst bit of CG in the film was right at the end with the owl. I mean, the owl is always going to be a bit ambitious for this era of CG, isn't it? Just because of the texture. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But somehow still better than Free Jack. <laughs> <laughs> yes, if you'd like to uh, listen to our episodes of other sh- films that are either better than Free Jack, worse than Free Jack, or that actually are Free Jack... Uh, we have a whole library of episodes available. You can also donate to our Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash the geek show, where you can get an exclusive bonus episode every month. There should be one just uh, a week or so after this one comes out, in fact. But until next week, when we're back with more Pop Screen, that's been your lot from Pop Screen. This has been your lot from this special Bowie month of Pop Screen. I've been Graham. I've been Rob. And we'll see you next time. Thank you.